My name's Kate Corrado, and I'm a musician and a songwriter, and I put in my bio, Aspiring Theater Kid, which really resonates with me right now. Um, I'm lucky enough to be on this panel, uh, thanks to my friends at Youth on Record. And I have with me some real theater kids, Michelle Rocket, Neela Pekarik, and in on the phone, Kaylin Heffernan. <laughs> So I'll let you all introduce yourselves, and maybe could you slip in what your favorite musical is? Oh. Neela has to go first. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Neela Pekarik. Uh, thanks for pronouncing that perfectly. Um, yeah, I am also a, a theater kid at heart. Uh, grew up doing musicals in school. And my gateway musical, I always say, was Rent. That got me into this world. Um, but uh, I think Les Mis is probably my favorite musical. Yep. Mm. Um, I'm Michelle Rocket. I am the interim director of Creative Youth and Development at Youth on Record. I also am in a band called The Milk Blossoms and do my own solo work. Uh, I'm working on a musical right now called Rose the Fierce, which is about my grandmother. Um, and I very distinctly remember exactly where I was when I watched Dream Girls, the movie version for the first time. And when I heard I'm Telling You and Jennifer Hudson just like nailing that part, I uh, I was like, oh. So I was like in the back of a van, like, you know, when you have DVDs in cars still, you know, because you needed to like entertain your your kids or whatever. And I just remember like being glued to that. So I think Dream Girls is actually still up there for me. Um, Caitlin, do you want to try to introduce yourself? Sure, I'm Caitlin. Oh, you got it. And I am not a theater kid or was not a theater kid until now. So I think my f my entry... Okay, wait, hold on. Hold on real quick. Sorry to interrupt you. That was... Talk a little. Yeah. Little talky. Yeah. Okay, so you're on the big speaker now, so do not, do not include too many profanities or like at least a smaller amount. <laughs> <laughs> okay? Okay. <laughs> One, two, three, three, three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. You could. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Keep going. <laughs> That's okay. Um, my probably intro to musical is Little Mermaid. <laughs> oh. Um, I will follow that up with. Uh, another Alan Menken hit, Little Shop of Horrors, is my favorite. And uh, today's the 40th anniversary of its off-Broadway premiere. Wow. Nice. So, Neela's written a musical. Michelle is writing a musical. Helps Kaylin also on a musical. So, these folks are all people who have experience in the indie rock scene and various other parts of the music scene and then they turned those talents toward musical theater and I just love it. I'm so impressed um, and I want to know, it's a huge project. I'm trying to write a musical right now too. Neela is telling me I am writing a musical um, <laughs> and it is hard. It's so hard to find the time. It's hard to stay with it. It's a big project. How did you start? What kept you going? When did you ask for help? Um, so in high school, I uh, was a theater kid, big theater nerd, came to the thespian conventions here in Denver from Little Durango, um, loved it, wanted to pursue a bachelor's um, in performance. At the time, didn't see anyone who looked like me. So like really discouraged by this, I uh, just pivoted to music. Um, and I had a great time and have been having a great time. And then a couple years ago, I think 2019, um, Family Theater Company approached Kaylin and Wheelchair Sports Camp to write original music for Alice in Wonderland. Kaylin then called me and was like, do you want to write this musical with me? And I said, okay. <laughs> um, and that really reignited my love for theater. I've always been a theater fan. Um, and uh, that was just like a reintroduction on how collaborative the art form really is. Um, I was kind of mentioning this uh, at the last panel, but like band, the band world and the music industry can be like 
harshly territorial um, and very competitive in a way that I think is uh, is not, is not is unsustainable. And so, coming back into the theater world and seeing how big of a team it really takes was really uh, humbling. Was also like it sort of at a certain point doesn't become your vision and it becomes the group vision. The commitment in theater is way different um, than it is in the band world. And so I, I asked for a lot of help a lot of the time. And that was kind of new for me. I think in, in music world, the expectation is to do everything by yourself all of the time. There was like this really, this big shift where you didn't need music labels anymore, and so everything was democratized, which brought a lot of beautiful things. It brought the sort of like renaissance of music technology and the creative misuse of that. But uh, it also put a lot of pressure on artists to do everything all the time. And asking for help is really just a, a result of like, it's not that I don't think I'm worthy of help. It's just that I'm so used to not having it available that I just like forget. So that was a nice sort of reminder in the theater world that like everyone is there to help each other. Um, so I ask for help all the time now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I would just echo all of that, that it, it's sup a super collaborative art form, um, musical theater. And um, I also came from being a theater kid and then I went sort of into the band world by accident a little bit. Um, I was a member of the Lumineers for about eight years. And, um, halfway through kind of our uh, halfway through that time I started writing a bunch of songs about a story that I felt inspired by um, it was a story of a Colorado uh, person that lived here around the turn of the century and she became notorious in the 1920s for encountering a rattlesnake migration and she killed 140 rattlesnakes took her two hours and then she gathered the skins and fashioned a flapper style dress from them and I saw this dress, it's uh, held in the Greeley Historical Museum, and they called her Rattlesnake Kate. And I got pretty obsessed with this woman and started writing songs about her without the vision at first to like write a musical, to write an album, really. I just was kind of writing song by song, mostly just to share with friends and like make them laugh. <laughs> and um, then I became really consumed by it. And I think theater requires that commitment of kind of all consumption in this good way. Um, but I... Uh, I, at that time, I was touring with a band and making records and that kind of thing, and so it felt natural to make an album first. And I, um, I think there's so many ways to crack into theater, um, and if you're interested in this art form, that means you're probably a pretty creative person. And so I think there's no blueprint for it. Um, and I happened to do it in the way of like a song cycle on a concept album, and I toured kind of this one woman show, a replica of the snakeskin dress and all, um, and uh, through that then got in touch with the um, DCPA and we've turned it into a full-blown musical that premiered in February. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we just had uh, the Henry Awards on Monday, which is like Colorado's Tony Awards. Um, and we got eight of them Yay! that we took home. So thank you. It was really exciting. Yeah, it was, it was really fun um, and exciting. <laughs> Appreciate that. Oh, yeah, do you want to re-ask Kaylin the oh, question? Oh, yeah. Kaylin, the question was... Well, I think I got it. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> oh, now you can hear it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I jumped into it by completely the band world and was asked um, from the band to write music to um, a family's first original adaptation of something. Um, the family theater group has been in town for 33 something, 33, 35 years. And they're, from what we could tell, the first all disability theater group uh, in the country. And I had known Reagan, um, who was their art director at the time. And she, yeah, asked for Wheelchair Sports Camp to write music to Alice in Wonderland, and um, I asked for help immediately. I literally got done and called Michelle, because um, I didn't come from that world. I don't even like, up until now, didn't even like musicals. Like, I, I got really nervous and like, felt really overwhelmed and echo like, 
just feeling in the band world, like everything's got to be up to you. Um, and so, yeah, jumping into the theater and like writing music for a play that was also being written at the same time was like such a cool collaborative process that allowed me to like creative in more ways than I can in the band world because I'm delegating every task and um, it was so nice for me to like have a prompt or like have a character or have a scene or even like have a feeling to start writing songs Um, and we kind of broke it out like you know what songs need big numbers um, what songs are going to be more rappy, which songs are going to be more singy, um, what what songs are going to be more soundscapes. And that alone just, like, freed me up in so many ways because I think art can be anything, which is, like, beautiful and also terrifying because you can start anywhere. So just, like, having that starting point and then having, like, such a full-blown team and that, like dedication has definitely shifted me and I am going to really struggle in the band world um, for the rest of my life probably. I don't know. We're all smiling in support of that struggle. Um, (laughs) It's such a collaborative art form. That's part of what drew me to it too. I'm a little bit isolationist and I think I was looking for like, what's something I absolutely can't do by myself. So when you're working through your works, what, you know, are there people you didn't know you would need? Where did you find them? Or... Any way you want to approach that sort of collaboration? Yeah, I mean, I think at every level, uh, I found people that I didn't know I needed. <laughs> um, even just from a music side, like w- what you said rang so true, of, like you get really protective of your music. And so um, we had both a music director and then eventually an orchestrator as well. And I thought like, I don't need any <laughs> of these things. And I absolutely did. And it was it sounded so much better. And I think letting go of those sort of keeping it so close, um, kind of feeling paranoid about that stuff is really good because what was nice about making a record first is I could sort of put everything on, a, on an album that was in my brain and then you hand it over to someone else and their brain kind of takes it through their filter. Um, and it, it ends up, I think the tough balance is how much do you hold your ground of like, this is the idea that I want and how much to you know open that creativity. Um, and it just depends on who you work with and finding the right people to surround yourself with that really respect the project, um, but still have tons of creativity to bring to the table. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think for me, it's a combination of like people I didn't know I, I needed in the music side and then the, com- the like very kind of newer world for me of everything else, costumes, mm-hmm. set, design. Um, you know, I had, there's all these titles sound designer you know it's sort of like I know you do something important but I don't actually don't know what it is and then it's it's really cool because like they can be really focused on doing that one thing very well um like to your point like we ended up so we ended up the first round of demos for Alice in Wonderland was due in May of 2020 so we finished demos thinking that we were going to have all this time in the studio with musicians but instead everyone was working remotely and so then we would receive all of these different takes and Kaylin and you know big part to her work was like rifling through all of that and it was like we needed an array like we need she essentially became the arranger Mm -hmm. because like even the traditional way to record an album became inaccessible Mm -hmm. so it was like all right we got to create a problem solve and we have to pivot um and so I think with that we probably could have used additional people on the team for like even like finances you know or like for just like things that were like operational in addition to the creative world Um, because again those two worlds are it's really cool when you could do them at the same time as an artist like it's actually pretty coveted and like should be should be uh, is very relevant it's like if you can do the emails and you can do the job and do the set great but yeah I think you have to start because there's it's so massive 
Um, and even on the scale, like for family, like family puts on really professional shows and has for a long time. Um, they do not mess around. It's still just like, it was such a long process that you have to have like so many. So co like collaboration can mean a lot of different things to people too. So I, I do want to like hearken back to collaboration, but you have to have communication in that. You have to have understanding. You have to have constant planning, project management in order to collaborate well. Like who's, what's your strength? What's your weakness? And so that's like, you can hide your weaknesses on albums. You, you can't hide them in theater. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's my long answer. <laughs> Caitlin, how about you? <laughs> Well, I'm just going to repeat a bunch of what Michelle said. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, I well, like, have only really made music with other people. It's pretty rare for me to do it, like, by myself. Um, and family just being such a, like, long-standing, pun intended, um, theater company that <laughs> they... They have all these like dope people to collaborate with already, and then it was really cool how um, like a lot of our circles of collaborators kind of intersected with that, and like we were able to pull in my friend Mo Graham, who was like already designing some stuff for a music video and some stuff in our meow wolf room. Like she got to do some stuff on the set, and then on longtime friend Kate Werner, who's toured and did sound with us in prison, uh, ended up doing sound for that. Uh, our old buddy Thomas, like, ended up building me this awesome beat machine and with sound designers, so um, it, it really, like, was just, like, such a family. <laughs> um, and... Yeah, it was so wild collaborating with that many musicians for a record. I did the same thing, at, like Neela talked about, of like making this record uh, ready and then tra started to translate it to the live show. Um, and the director, Reagan Linton, did a really great job at like, um, giving us as much prep as she could um, so that we wrote kind of already having an idea of what it would be like live um, and doing everything remotely was definitely challenging uh, <laughs> to like we only met on Zoom and most of the arranging was like you know, me and Michelle doing a Zoom sesh, and then me and someone else doing a Zoom sesh, and then, like, we only had one time where we, like, listened all together as a group, and that was, like, the day before we turned in demos, and um, I I do think, though, that, like, had it, it really benefited the sound and the story of being, like, Alice in Wonderland down from the rabbit hole, because... So many of us were isolated and in our own rabbit holes that even though we were like working separately and remotely and like not even with a ton of like um, direction, it all ended up coming together in like such a wild, cool way that I think if we were all together, we probably would have started like getting on the same momentum or the same vibe and because we were all in such different places, it really, like, added to the story and chaos of Wonderland. Um, but the sessions and the files was, was whoa. <laughs> yeah. So with all this collaboration and you're talking about all these different entry points into theater, I think it's such a wide open art form for folks to get into. Um, what, what sort of advice do you have for people who are wanting to, please give me some advice <laughs> for how to like dip a toe into it or like um, start small um, because it can be such a 
um, expansive and freeing place to be writing, but it's also a great place to maybe find another income stream as a musician, as a pit player, as a sound engineer. Um, any, any hot tips? Maybe just the Denver scene. There's so much incredible theater happening here. We already talked about family theater company. Um, yeah, I think there's so many entry points and you should definitely talk about what you're working on with your TikTok stuff. Um, but I think there are, there's, there's not really like a right or wrong way to do this. And so, um, I think what, it, what you talked about sort of the vastness of writing for musicals and what I love about it is actually, I feel like it gives me an assignment, some parameters to write within. And I like that as a songwriter because then you can also like write about your own stuff, but through this mask of the characters and kind of sneakily put your baggage in there. Um, and so I, I, and I'm like a student in my heart. And so I feel like when I know like a song needs to get us from point A to point B, um, and the rule with musical theater is you want to feel differently at the end of the song than you felt at the beginning. And so it's really a driving narrative as opposed to songs on albums. We want them to be hooky and beautiful and that kind of thing. But in, in theater, I think it's um, it really serves a purpose. And so that, that parameters, I think, are helpful. Um, but yes, like you said, entry points in terms of not just writing musicals or performing in them. Um, there's so many different jobs that go into it. And, and we do have a thriving theater scene here. I was just at the Henry's on Monday and there's so many small theaters and big theaters here um, that it doesn't have to be this sort of huge traditional way to get into this. Um, I just was listening to this podcast musical. It's called 36 Questions and it came out a few years ago and a friend just told me about it, but I was like, why aren't there, why isn't everyone doing this right now? But um, yeah, there's podcast musicals, there's TikTok musicals, there's all kinds of stuff going on. So I think if you're interested, there's totally an entry point. Um, yeah, I, in between high school and now, not being in high school, uh, I did run sound at Town Hall Arts Center um, and actually that was one of the most informative and stressful jobs I've ever had because live sound in the theater world is really in, in service to the story. And so it allowed me to think about sound design and sound production in a way that was related to what was going on. As opposed to like, you know, bands, like you, you start to, you learn how to EQ, right? You learn how to mix and balance. And, and with theater, it had that additional component that made sense to me, which was storytelling. And so, um, you know, I, there was like 20 body mics, which are these wireless microphones that actors sweat out um, and sometimes stop working uh, in the middle of the show. I, I once mixed Spring Awakening, which is a... It's got like old, you know, I don't even know what century it is, um, but mixed with like concert style. Uh, so they went from body, wireless body mics to wireless handhelds in the middle of scenes at different times. And I was like, no, um, but it helped me. It was like, it was a way to be a part of it without being the writer or the director or even an actor at that point. And it helped me understand everything as a whole. Um, so I think that's, they're always looking for like A1s or A2, like people who run the soundboard. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's a possible entry point um, if you're not a performer. Uh, I think is sound and lights and, and all of those other like tangible things. Um, I did accidentally stumble into a TikTok world of musical theater that has been really fun and and like was my way to bridge like my love of musical theater and like the absurdity of it into like a very bite-sized platform. So TikTok, my videos are very short, like you can do up to three minutes or 10 minutes now or whatever, but I like to try to keep it like within a minute. Um, and I think what it is like, it's like, it is that juxtaposition of, of uh, so I write like a, if uh, it's from the 2000s were like a musical and I, I, I sing Shaggy's It Wasn't Me in the style of musical theater. But what it is is that sort of like a good cover is a flip, right? Like it's a re-understanding or like a re-telling of something that we know. So like hearing Shaggy's about like, picture this, we were both butt naked banging on the bathroom floor, you know, like something so absurd like that, it makes people rethink it. And I think that's why people connected with it also because it's so silly. Uh, <laughs> and it's, <yeah. laughs> or, 
you know, like um, my favorite thing I've ever made, sorry, Milk Blossoms, is the Potato the Musical, um, <laughs> which is like about this sad potato who's about to be eaten. And I just think it's so, like, I think both Neela and Kayla, uh, Kaylin have talked to this point where it's like to write outside of yourself is actually so refreshing to not have to like r distill and write and reflect in this way. That's like every emotion I've ever felt in every breakup ever is so nice. And actually my creativity lives more in being able to write outside of myself and knowing that like, it's still me, you know, I think there's a lot of pressure as an artist and especially as a solo artist to be um, like this, amplified version of yourself or like this um, person that's worth of being idolized or being revered and uh, it can kind of like really mess with your brain so yeah writing a a song with Kaylin about a French mouse was like way more fun <laughs> yeah Kaylin do you want to talk on that um yeah I don't know if I have great advice um Besides, like, get in where you fit in, and it, you know, musicals don't have to, like, have this giant team, giant budget, giant theater. Um, there's awesome, like, solo shows and, like, some really cool avant-garde um, and, like, just weirdo theater companies doing, like, pretty small and powerful productions all the time, but... Um, I think I was I was reflecting on this yesterday, hearing part of like a Congress briefing, boring thing, and I was like, people are so wired to absorb information in ways that like aren't super accessible, and I like I think the power of musicals and storytelling with music is like allows us to retain information at such like higher levels. I remember being like taught my times tables um, in music form and like row, row, row your boat kind of stuff. And, and now I like still to this day, you know, only think about my nines in Mary had a little bit or whatever. Like um, I, I really, yeah, it really, like, gave me, again, like, writing outside of myself and um, just having some kind of anchor outside of, like, all your deepest, darkest inner demons is, like, such a freeing experience to still, like, go in any place that you want. But, um, yeah, I was able to write, like, a that's the police song and made it about hating all cats and dogs because the French mouse is like drowning and like had had I not had that that prompt or or like an opportunity like Alice in Wonderland like there was no way I was gonna make that kind of song accessible to like kids and um yeah, and just, like, not so literal, I think, especially, like, information and, like, politics and policies and even organizing, like, it's thrown at us in such, like, wordy, classist ways that, like, not everybody gets into, and that's why people love music and concerts and art, and when we can combine the two, like, I think... Yeah, it's just it's just such a powerful tool. So I think you know musicals can be used in the classrooms and um, in the music world and in visual art world, like really wherever. I I do I, yeah, and I do wish the theater world was more financially accessible. Mm -hmm. It's so expensive. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I know that's not part of the question, but it just reminded me like, dang, like, and really to experience something in person like that is very different than trying to, for them to capture it on film or like, I haven't really, there've been a couple instances where people have tried to do movie musicals that I think are closer. Yeah. But um, I think everyone, we do have that relationship between musicians, uh, bands and musical theater world during the pandemic, we were trying to pivot, but it's it was really difficult to try and figure out 
what is it about being a person or being together or being live or like not having multiple camera angles that makes this magical? And I don't know if we really ever figure it out, but maybe we will. And maybe that will lend itself to like the financial accessibility of it to be on YouTube or to be on whatever. Um, but yeah, that is something that I wish was like, even as an adult who makes money, it's like still too expensive for me yeah. sometimes. <laughs> theater industry I think is like one of the most tightly controlled things like mm -hmm. Broadway theaters are running these huge productions it costs like 9.6 million dollars on average to even get to opening night on a at a Broadway theater which is only like 40 theaters in the city of New York um, so it's so refreshing to hear about all of these smaller and um, more grassroots indie musicals, because um, I think a lot about how the general public perceives musical theater. I had kind of a frustrating conversation with somebody um, who was, I think their experience of musicals was perhaps more of the like entertainment only kind of, um, it was, I saw, I don't want to call it out, but I saw Moulin Rouge, which I have my own frustrations about. Um, and I can talk about that some other time, but it's a production, right? And so this person I was talking to was like, oh, musical theater is like just for fun. It's, it doesn't have that impact and that political leaning of other art forms. And I'm curious to know what you all have to say about that. We've already dipped into it a little bit and I, I'd love to hear more. Uh, uh, maybe this is defensive, but it's like musical theater has always been like on the on the on the cutting edge. Like musical theater has been a reflection of popular culture for a long time, um, and it has been a result of like lived experiences throughout time. Um, so, I do think there is a lot of stigma with musical theater and theater in general, um, but. It, it has always been like the art of changing minds. Um, yeah, through, through intense collaboration, through storytelling. And uh, I'll stop there before I <laughs> rant. <laughs> yeah. I know, I, I feel the same. I couldn't, I couldn't disagree more with that statement. Um, I think there's a very small percentage of musicals that maybe are just fluff, but I, I think that's actually not representative of most musicals, um, that even if there are like jazz hands and <laughs> smiling faces, a lot of it is deeper than that. And I think that's been a, the case for musical theater for a long time as well. Um, and I, I mean, even for my show, like I, I got so inspired by Rattlesnake Kate because I thought she was a woman that like pushed the boundaries of what it meant to be feminine. And in reading through a lot of her um, letters she had written and that type of thing, I just felt like I identified with her in this way that I was in this very male-dominated industry and a very male-dominated band um, without a voice a lot of the time. And I sort of felt like she had that aspect to her as well. And um, in writing that show, I really felt like it helped me become a little more authentically myself and a little more outspoken. Um, so I feel changed by that show. And I'm, the goal sort of was to help other people feel that way um, in writing the show. So... Kaylin? <laughs> uh, my, well, my, it's cutting out quite a bit, so will you repeat the question for me? Yeah, just wanting to hear more about your thoughts on the impact, the potential impact of musical theater um, with as far as like political issues and our society in general. Yeah, I, I mean, it kind of talked about that the last one, but basically, like, I really, I just really think especially reaching to, like, wider audiences and across the age, like, spectrum and across disability spectrum, across, like, race, um, when you combine that storytelling and or information, important, useful information with, like, music, um, it's just way more likely to, to stick with us forever. Um, and, you know, that's always been the power of music, but when when we can, like, you know, put this 
like deeper meaning and and information and organizing efforts and into the music i think we could really like do a lot and i mean nothing super important and great it has been done without music um and i think the theatrics of the entire um apocalypse we're experiencing is like something that you know we should be like showcasing all the time um and i think we do but i it's it's difficult and i know that like in these times of survival like it's really feels impossible to be creative but also like if we're gonna make it we have to kind of take breathers and like dance and sing and enjoy ourselves in those ways that we think you know not everybody loves music but not everybody loves theater either so when you combine the two then everybody's happy you know <laughs> yeah i agree everyone should be happy in a <laughs> seeing a musical um so we're lucky enough to have an an all-female panel, a slightly more represented, um, underrepresented folks represented on this panel. Um, but the musical theater scene, at least like the big Broadway shows, it's not quite the same. Um, what do you think we need to do to make sure there's more folks with um, marginalized identities in this space? We talked a little bit about financial accessibility, and I think that's a huge part of it. If you can't see it, you don't know that you want to do it. And on top of that, if you don't see yourself in it, like Michelle, you mentioned, it becomes less appealing that way too. So what are your thoughts around that? Or if you have examples of folks we should be checking out. Yeah, I think... Uh a lot of it comes from the top down. I think uh, hiring folks that are marginalized in positions of power, I think we're doing a better job in terms of casting, but I think still the majority of directors and creators tend to be white folks, tend to be men. And um, I think hiring within the teams that are making the decisions that are programming seasons, that are artistic directors, the more we can diversify those people and those jobs, um, the more we can diversify those positions, I think is a much it's a trickle down effect. Yeah, I give money, you know. Um, <laughs> uh, I was telling Nila before this, like how scary it is to move from the music industry into this theater world because of the timeline. So to write a musical and to see it from start to finish, you know, can be seven years, can be 17 years. Strange Loop right now, which just open on Broadway, Michael R. Jackson has been working on that for like 20 something years. So that's really scary for me because like, you know, I thought an album took a long time. It, woof, like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, you're devoting a lot of your life into a project that could never see, you know, um, the stage ever, whether that's Broadway or whether that's local, like it's, it's, uh, it's scary. Um, so I think time and money and resources, um, there are really exciting things happening. Uh, I do see myself as far as like in the industry right now, a lot of musicians have turned to musical theater, have started with concept albums, you know, Hades Town, Waitress by Sarah Bareilles. Like there are musicians making the pivot and they've taken all of their information, all the things. And I think Lin-Manuel Miranda, who did In the Heights and Hamilton was in the same position where he's like, I had to write my part, right? Like there was nothing for me, so I had to write it. And eventually we have this like smash hit and goes to show that like this can be commercially viable. Um, you have new audience members who want to see it. Like he he <laughs> he like had this like he was like the supreme label of musical theater. Like it was just like so exclusive and so wonderful. And it's still now like all over and you get to see cast that doesn't sort of look like your typical thing. Um, I have my own thoughts about Hamilton, my own things, but I think that's that's a that's how big things will just sort of like you said, trickle down or like impact and ripple. Um, I, not to go back to TikTok too much, but like that place is also really cool because people make musicals on that app and from all over. And so like they did Ratatouille the musical. <laughs> 
um, across, and they, you know, somebody picked it up, and then they like performed it with real people. Bridgerton, the musical, started on TikTok and is now going to be on stage. Like it's, it's really incredible because you are kind of bypassing some of that, like the big money stuff, you know, in order to like collaborate on a global um, format. So, um, yes, that's just my answer. <laughs> Um, yeah, I have hardly ever seen people that look like me, um, casted, and when they are, especially in media, it's very, like, pitiful and, like, charitable and Shriners commercials, um, so for me, like, seeing the first family production that I saw with, like, that many disabled people all casted with integrity I was like you know left sobbing because I when I show up to like disability things I sadly was like expecting somewhat mediocre because that's just like how it goes in the disability world and and then here's like a cast of 30 people with like pretty clear or significant disabilities um so that was like monumental for me. Um, and there's some outside of family who's, you know, kind of bigger deal. Um, there's a really cool theater group in uh, the Oakland area called Sins in the Valley. And they do some really provocative um, disability, queer, mostly people of color um, led productions. and. Yeah, it's not only just casted, but um, the whole the whole thing, um, the whole production is mostly disabled. Um, and I also caught like an incredible production from Buntport um, not that long ago yeah, about um, Artemisia, and it was like so well well done and only two-person um, production and super small theater here on the west side uh, and you know family's still going strong um, but yeah I think I think the way we cast like does have a really big effect especially in the future um, it might be kind of hard to tell now but like enough kids grow up seeing themselves represented, I think, has a really long-lasting impact. Yeah, that kind of um, leads well into my next question about where do you think musical theater is headed, or where would you like to see it go? I've seen some really, I'll just put a little plug in for a production I saw recently by Control Group Productions called The End. And it was a little musical, a lot of dance, very immersive, um, and I just loved it. We were on this cool bus tour all over Denver. This weekend's the last weekend to catch it, so if you need a break from UMS, I'd recommend getting on that bus. Um, but I would just, I just love seeing the creativity, and it's like we keep saying, it's just this vast art form with so many possibilities. Like, what do you think? the musical theater world needs um, and who is going to do it. Yeah, I, uh, I hope for more original stories because I, I think that when it comes down to it, musical theater is about storytelling, um, regardless of how it's dressed up and what kind of songs it has or what kind of choreography it has. I think at its core, it's about telling great stories. And so I'm always bummed out when it's another movie we've seen or just a story that we all know. So I think stories that haven't been told um, I can't wait for this musical about your grandmother. <laughs> Looking forward to that. Um, and yeah, just I, I think there's so much creativity to to be had, and it's a bummer when I go see a show that I'm like, wait, I know so many creative people um, that could be doing something. So I think original stories, yeah. Uh, yeah, I definitely agree. I think um, in addition to what I would like to see, I I think a lot a lot of popularity and trends uh, come from the filling of voids, right, of what we don't have. I would love to see musical theater push themselves as far as sound production 
and um, sound design a little bit more. So like I, coming from a production background um, and recording, I think like I watched Hamilton for the first time live the other day and I was like, at this point it's what, like, I don't know, seven years old or something. It's like almost a decade old. It's still running hot. Um, and at the time, no one had seen like it. Like, oh my God, hip hop, R&B on the Broadway stage at this level, incredible. Um, so that was like, I think like filling a void of genres uh, or like certain sounds that we weren't hearing at that level. And so the way that we hear them, I, I would like to, to see yeah, I would like to see the combination maybe more of like concerts, you know, um, or tracks in the way they're being used or uh, the way voices can be used. Like, I, I just think that there's a lot of exploration and room in, in that form. Um, we go from like turntablist in the, in the pit, you know, to a whole maybe music production team and below could be really cool. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I was going to say the same thing of, like, I wish there was more crossover between, like, theater world and music world and art world because they have so many similarities and they, like, rely on each other in so many ways and, like, so many of the theater kids I was hanging out with, like, don't go to a ton of concerts and... A lot of us who go to a ton of concerts don't go to a ton of plays, and it seems like such a missed um, opportunity. And I recently just saw like Shakespeare in Central Park, and they, the music also was like trying to be more like urban and contemporary. And I I thought it was like pretty poorly done, but I guess in the theater world, like it might have been maybe provocative, I don't know, but yeah, I think coming from also a production background, I'm like, oh god, those midi horns are trash, you know? <laughs> um, and it, it, <laughs> I just wish, like, we relied on each other a little bit more to make, because then, regardless, like, whatever production the crossover is, is going to be that much better, because people who do concerts all the time are going to help make productions better and people who act all the time will make concerts better, you know? Yeah. So it sounds like we're out of time, but um, let's thank our panelists again, Neela Pekarik, Kaylin Heffernan, and Michelle Rocket. Um, this has been so wonderful. Thanks for your time, and thank you all for joining us, and have a great UMS. Bye, Kaylin. Love you, Kaylin.